But tonight we're going to look at Romans 8 and the results of what Christ did for us. There's a powerful passage, and I bet you know this, and that's from Romans chapter 8 where the Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation. Yeah, we're going to look at that and, and what it means. But before we do tonight, I want to remind you that Jesus literally was focused upon the sufferings that his passion, he was just focused upon them. John, the Gospel of John, and I would encourage you to read and study carefully the Gospel of John during the next few days before Easter gets here so that you have a full appreciation of how laser-focused Jesus was upon his sufferings. He told Pilate, he said, for this reason I was born and I have come into the world. For this reason, what? His sufferings. When he was standing before Pilate and Pilate was just confused of what to do with him and he was afraid of the Jews and, and Jesus told him, he said, you have no power over me except what God has allowed you to have. And he said, but it was for this purpose. What purpose? To suffer and to die for our sins. So, number one, through Christ... I am free from all condemnation. We read um, Romans 8, 1, there is now no more condemnation for those that belong to Christ. Yeah. We all know John 3, 16. Yeah. For God came to, into this world to forgive us. Yeah. But the very next verse says he didn't <laughs> come that he would bring condemnation, yeah. but bring life. I'm not laughing because it's humorous, <laughs> but this brings such joy to me to fully understand why Christ came. You know, I love reading war histories, and there's always an operation something, operation this, operation yeah. that. You could really call what Jesus did Operation Liberation. Nothing took him by surprise. No. And we can't just isolate out Good Friday yeah. and the resurrection. Everything that was leading up to that time was a part of his plan. Yeah. Well, let's look. Would you read that for Romans 8, 1? And read it. For, this is from the New Living Translation. There's a reason I want to use that. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, you know the word therefore is, is used in a lot of translations. And that's a good translation, therefore is. So I want to bring out the therefore, but I really want you to look at the no condemnation. What is the therefore for? That's the question you should always ask when you read that word. What's what it is, there for? What's it there for? <laughs> And we'll get to that, but notice that, as a matter of fact, if you're using the app, just kind of highlight it, or if you're taking notes on paper, underline or underline in your Bible, no condemnation. There's where the heavy emphasis is in the Greek language, no condemnation. God wants you to know there is no condemnation. And why? I'm going to read real rapidly. Let me read these. Okay. And when I finish, you read that one word, okay? All right. All right. Paul goes back to Romans 1 to demonstrate that all human beings are under the condemnation of sin. And we won't be able to get through this message if I go all the way back through that. But if you're interested, email me and I'll, I will write you back about that or refer you to some messages. I preached on that before. But he goes all the way back, Romans chapter 1. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Condemnation. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Condemnation. For God shows no partiality. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Condemnation. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We know that first. Condemnation. <laughs> Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men and women because all sinned. Condemnation. Condemnation. Are you getting tired of saying I'm that word yet? That one. <laughs> yeah. For the wages of sin is death. Condemnation. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Condemnation. <laughs> you see, Paul has been, he's masterful. The way the Holy Spirit authors this book, and this is why Romans is such a powerful book. And I spent two and a half years preaching <laughs> yes. through the book of Romans in midweek services here. 
Two and a half years is Paul builds this case so that we understand the condemnation that we were all born under because of our sin. But thank God you read that now. So now there is no condemnation <laughs> for those who belong to Christ Hallelujah. Jesus. And, a, and that's the qualifier yeah. for that there is no condemnation. The qualifier is for those who belong to Christ Jesus. You're exactly right. And again, I'm not laughing because it's humorous. It's joy to me. Condemnation is crippling. Oh. It will keep us from succeeding. It will keep us from being the person God wants us to be. It will keep us from seeing ourselves as God sees us. Do you remember the young woman in our church in Georgia that she was she had given her heart to yes. Christ? She was doing so well and yet she struggled. It was just so hard for her to grasp the idea. Yeah that everything that had happened prior to her conversion, that God could just make that disappear. And he did. <clears throat> Nothing can wash away our sins but the blood of Jesus. But why now no condemnation? And the answer to that is simple. is because Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has been crucified. That's why now there is no condemnation. Today, I was talking with a business person here in our community, and we were talking about Easter, and I said, they wanted to know what I was preaching on tonight, and so I was telling them what I was preaching on. They said, really? And I go, yeah. I said, you know, we spend a lot of time getting ready for, for Christmas as a culture, but even in the church, we spend a lot of time, you know, doing mm -hmm. Christmas series and Christmas messages and Christmas music. But I said, unfortunately, people in our culture and even many churches, and we've always done this here at Woodland, even in many churches, they don't spend time contemplating why Easter? Because without Easter, there would be no Christmas. Without Easter, then we've just read a good book, a yeah. good story. Yeah, but you've got to go through the passion or the sufferings of Christ mm -hmm. and Good Friday to really appreciate Easter. So that's why we're doing this. So again, the emphasis is on no condemnation. Now I want to take you back to the book of Genesis. And you know this, I have been going verse by verse through Genesis again after my morning devotions. It's been so fascinating. And sometimes you know something and you forget it. And we've talked about this. I did a series through Genesis for two and a half years as well. No, Genesis is a much longer <laughs> book than Romans. But if you ever start on Psalms, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my swan song. <laughs> but in Genesis chapter 6, and those of you who went through Genesis with me, you'll remember this. Look at Genesis. Would you read that? Make room in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Genesis 6, 14. Now that word pitch is an interesting word mm -hmm. because the word pitch is used over and over again. That Hebrew word Kapper, I'm not sure I'm saying my Hebrew right. It's used over and over. The word pitch is also the word for atonement. Something that totally seals out everything that would destroy what's within. Yeah, yeah. Seals it out, but it also seals it from within as well. It does. <laughs> and so here's what happened is God told Noah to build the ark and then to cover it inside and out with pitch. That word, I believe, was a word picture prophesying mm -hmm. the, the sufferings and the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word atonement, I remember one of my theology professors when I was really young, he said, if you really want to understand the word atonement, remember at one meant, at one meant, that God makes us one with him. It's the atonement of our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his sufferings for us, that saves us. You and I, Hallelujah. I feel like preaching tonight. <laughs> you and I are covered by the blood of Jesus inside and out. We are saved securely. We don't, in our culture, don't always have a good picture of what mm. atonement no, is. No, we don't. The, the Hebrews, the Jews, those that were following Christ, they would have understood that because atonement meant a total substitute. Absolutely. Do you remember the scapegoat in the Old Testament? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's a whole other story you can go and read, but it was like something becoming a substitute for that sin in my life. Yeah. Well, the whole picture of atonement, you're right. The person offering the sacrifice would have to lay their hands on the head mm -hmm. of the sacrifice, 
And therefore, they were, it was a picture of the transferring of their sins mm -hmm. to the sacrificial animal. God accepted the blood of an innocent animal for their sins. And the picture you just said, there's, that's, a scape, that's a type. The scapegoat, Jesus, the scapegoat was a type of Jesus Christ, that our sins were transferred to Looking him. For, we understand <clears throat> um, it's not my fault. Yeah. I might have done it, but it wasn't my fault. Somebody else influenced. <laughs> someone else made me do it. It's someone else impact in my life. It's not my fault. Therefore, I'm not responsible. We also understand. <laughs> not me. Not, not me. me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put this in your outline if you want to just follow along with me. The word pitch here that we get our word atonement from, it means to atone by offering a substitute. The great majority of the usages concern the priestly ritual of sprinkling of the sacrificial blood, thus making an atonement for the worshiper. And that's from an excellent resource you should add to your library if you really want to study words. It's the theological word book of the Old Testament. Actually, Gleason Archer was the, um, was the, the Greek text that I had mm -hmm. in college was written by Gleason Archer. And then we took a class from Dr. Walkie yeah. later on on the book of, on the wisdom literature of the scripture. So a couple of things to point out here. Noah entered the ark when God told him to. You and I, we enter into new life. We enter into Christ by God's invitation. No one comes to the Father unless the Father draws them. But the beauty of the story is, you want to tell them? Sure. Yeah, God you tell shut them. the door. <laughs> God shut the door. Noah and his family went into the ark yeah. in obedience, yeah. but it was God that shut the door that was their protection, their covering, I've noticed a lot of young people now, will, when they're, they're happy about something or exclaiming about something, they go, shut the door. And every time they say that, I think about the ark. I laugh and then I go home and ask my kids, now what does that mean? Oh, I do that all the time. Sometimes I'll come home and ask them and they'll say, dad, you can't say that. Yeah, we've told you that quite a bit. So God shut Noah and his family safely and securely in the ark. And I just want you to know, when you give your heart to Jesus, God shuts you in safely and security, securely. Noah, listen, think about the flood for just a moment. And I need to lean back for a moment. The flood, it gives me more room. <laughs> The flood, Noah didn't hold on for dear life. Mrs. Noah didn't hold on for yeah. dear life. And, you know, God held on to them. And you're not saved by holding on to God. God is saving you because he's holding on to you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Have you, ever, have you ever seen someone that was like the lifeguards that go yeah. out to save someone? Is they, what do they tell you? Just relax and let me pull you in. Yeah. You know, just let me do it. Just relax. And that's hard. Yeah. We want to kick and scream, save me. And we're like, well, if you'll relax, I'll save you. <laughs> Sometimes I see people acting like little babies just kicking and screaming mm. and hollering. And I want to say, just relax. Breathe. The Father <laughs> is going to save you. So here's what I want you to know. Salvation, salvation is when I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am given new life. Whenever I confess my sins and invite Jesus into my heart, I was given new life. The old life has passed away, Yeah. the scripture says. I mean, it is gone. It's not coming back. What else has passed away? I don't know. Condemnation. <laughs> <laughs> condemnation. Now, what I get in place of condemnation is? Justification. Justification. I like the way we teach the kids to say that in Timber Ridge. How do you do that? Just as if I never sinned. That's exactly right. <laughs> do they say it back to you? Oh, yeah. So if I ask one this Sunday, they're going to tell me just as if I yeah, never sinned. Yeah, they probably will. <laughs> Come on, Victory. I'm going to be looking for some kids Sunday morning. <clears throat> and by the way, please consider returning back to church. If you haven't been coming on Sunday morning, it's a safe place to come. We sanitize between every services and have social distancing, and we miss you. We want to see you. And if you're watching online, now let me, I'm going to be pastor. I'm jumping off the track here for just a moment. If you're watching we're, we're online. We're caught between condemnation and justification. There's here, no so. condemnation. No, this is wisdom. This is wisdom. If you're watching online, shut off your notifications, shut off everything else. And watch and worship with us online. Let yeah. your family have that worship experience. And then flip over to Timber Ridge mm -hmm. and 
Let, have a dance party. <laughs> yeah, be with your children, worship with your children, have the dance party, because we need to keep teaching our children. We need to keep joined yeah. and connected together. And we're having Timber Ridge. We're having our nurseries and our elevation. So please be sure and come back and join us. Well, justification, back to the sermon. You get advertisements on television. That so was your commercial break. That was your tonight. commercial break. Justification happens when I receive Christ. I get new life and forgiveness when I'm saved, when I receive Christ. But justification happens when I receive Christ, and now I'm given a new standing before God. Wow. Those are two different things. They happen like that. But I'm given a new standing. I receive new life. And then I'm justified. I stand before the God of the universe justified. But it is not the same thing mm -hmm. as forgiveness. No. We come back, we repent. <clears throat> yeah. We, we did the sin. Yeah. So we have to repent. The forgiveness comes from God. You're talking about after we get yes. saved. Yes. 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 Because we still sin, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the thing I'm constantly saying at Woodland. A pulpit can make you appear more holy than you are. I pray every day, you know, Father, forgive me of my sins for Jesus' sake. You know, today I was talking to you on the phone. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> cut me off. I mean, right on my bumper, uh, front bumper, and I had to hit the brakes, and I couldn't get over, and I just said, oh, well, mm -hmm. I didn't say a bad word, but I didn't say with the right attitude. Mm -hmm. So well, when I got to where I was going, I said, Lord, <laughs> I forgive that person right now. <laughs> but when you come back to God and you say, even if you sinned after you've gotten mm -hmm. saved, you're forgiven. You don't get saved all over again. That's what yeah. I thought growing up. Yeah. You know, if I did one sin, I can remember a preacher saying, if you say one bad word and the rapture happens, you're not going. It scared the stew out of me. <laughs> That's why we had to get saved again every Sunday night because oh, somewhere man. between last Sunday and this Sunday, stuff happens. <laughs> I really never knew if I was saved or not. And, and I will tell you this, when I was in Bible college, I was serving a church as a youth pastor, they'd asked me to come and serve as their youth pastor. So kind, good people. We've gone back mm -hmm. and preached for them even since we've been up here. But there was an oil family in the church, and they would have me out to their home a lot of times on Sunday afternoon for dinner. And he tried to teach me to play tennis. <laughs> it wasn't very effective. He had beautiful. Been good at baseball, huh? <laughs> yeah. He had beautiful grass courts. But I remember I came in for my afternoon Bible reading, and um, let me suggest you read your Bible through the day, not just in the morning or in the evening. And I was in the book of Hebrews, and I can remember I had this beautiful room on this beautiful ranch, and I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, sometimes I don't even want to read your word because I read it and I'm condemned. And while I'm praying there, it just dawned on me. That's mm -hmm. not the way my daddy wanted me to live. That's yeah. not the way my heavenly father wants me to live. And that can't be. So I began to talk to my professors. And this whole thing, there is now no condemnation for those that are Christ Jesus. You just talked about how we have taken precautions. We have, we mm -hmm. have done things so that our children are safe mm -hmm. when they come back for Timber Ridge. If we who are evil, yeah. born into an evil world, know how to give good gifts, know how to take care, know how to provide for our children's security. How much more does God yeah. desire to yeah. do that for us? You're exactly right. I shared this story over a decade ago at Woodland. I keep a record of all my illustrations, <laughs> so I don't overuse them. But, um, and I, I had searched the, the website Snopes just to be sure the story was accurate. It's actually built off of a story. It's about a Rolls Royce where a man had his Rolls Royce shipped to the United States and while he was on vacation here. And when he got to the resort that he was staying at, the Re Rolls Royce broke down. So he called the Rolls Royce company in Great Britain and they told him they would send over a, a mechanic and the tools and the springs, and they, they did. They repaired his Rolls Royce, got him going. And uh, months later, after he was back in Britain, he realized he'd never gotten a bill. So he wrote to Rolls Royce, and they said, we have no record of any Rolls Royce ever breaking down. 
We'd say, it is as if it never happened. It's as if it never happened. Now, that story sounds fantastical. It's actually built off of a real story that happened to someone by the name of, get it, Rudyard Kipling and oh, wow. his Rolls Royce. So there is truth to that. But here's the point I want to make. Your sins, they do not exist in the heart of the Father. He does not remember them against you. Well, we got to be quick. I got too excited here tonight. The second thing I want you to see is through Christ I have been redeemed. Jesus' suffering has also brought about the process of the operation of redemption. So if we had the operation of liberation, now we have the process of the operation redemption. So Romans 8, chapter 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now this is important because sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that the law of sin and death is the Mosaic law. That's not true. The law of sin and death is the operation of sin and death in my life mm -hmm. because we were all born sinners. We all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. And so what God has done is he's broke that power. Would you read uh, the next verse? And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Romans 8, 2. So what happens there is that God has done such a work in our lives, we don't have to yield to sin. And my prayer for all of us is that we will sin less and less and less as we grow in Christ. Even Paul talks about how he, at times, why is it that I don't do yep. what I want to do? And why do I, I say something yeah, mean? And I, the things that I do is not what I want to do, and what I want to do, I don't always do. That's because we have that, that sin nature in our life. Yeah. But the process of forgiveness and liberation, and then the ongoing process of redemption yeah. in our life. God breaks us free from yeah. that sin and death. And when you've been set free from something, right. you get away from it as fast as you can. You go, girl. You're doing good here tonight. <laughs> you know, I love the story of V-Day and V-E Day. Mm -hmm. The fierce fighting was after, the most fierce fighting of the entire war was after V-Day. The victory had already been accomplished, but the enemy was not vanquished until the surrender of Hitler or his suicide and the surrender of the Reich. Well, sin and death do not have the final say in my life. And you say, how is that? How does sin not have the power in my life anymore? Because the law of Moses, it's a good law. There's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. There's nothing wrong with the, the law. The law reveals what an imperfect pastor you have. The law reveals, can I say it this way, how imperfect you are too. I mean, that's why we say at Woodland, there's no room for perfect people. Because we're all imperfect. We're <laughs> all imperfect. And if you find the perfect church, don't you go there because you're going to mess it all up. <laughs> you know, there are no perfect people. But what we could not do, God did for us in Christ. Would you read the next verse? The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. That's what Paul was talking about That's in Romans 7. That's what Paul 7. was you talking about. So about. God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Why did Jesus die for our sins? He died for our sins because he loved us. He died for our sins because sin had condemned us to an eternity in hell and separated from God. You are not a product of evolution. You were created by God, for God, you were created to know God, and the greatest joy that you and I will ever have is not in each other, mm -hmm. it's not in the church, it's not in our children. The greatest joy you'll ever find is in Christ. And when He is your greatest joy, then your marriage, your family, your church, your community becomes the great joy to you it should be. But what Jesus did is He reversed the curse of sin. He pardoned me. He gave me new life. He yes. saved me. And then he sanctified me or he justified me. So I want to close with a story. And if you'll read this last passage, it's a little lengthy, but follow along with us. I heard a cute story about that. It was talking about how, you know, how could a God of love send people to hell? 
And the person that they said it to said, God doesn't send people to hell. Mm -hmm. People are on the road to hell. God provided all the exit ramps. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. (laughs) What shall we say about such a wonderful thing as these? If God is for us, then who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, who has given everything else, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. Read that again. Who then will condemn us? No No one. one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? No. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing in creation will ever be able to separate us from the love that God has revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Listen, God has covered you. He sealed you inside and out by the blood of his son Jesus. And he did that because he really loves you. You'll appreciate this story because you love all things Anglophile. But 1878, when Queen Victoria was Queen of England, her daughter, Princess Alice, married the ruler of a small German state. And you probably know this story already. It's a sad story. But they had several children, and some of them died because of a disease called black diphtheria. It was a contagious disease, kind of like COVID is. And their children died. Well, when their little boy came down with the black diphtheria, the doctors were insistent that Princess Alice could not see him. And she was standing outside the door while the doctor was treating him. And she heard him. You know the story. She (laughs) heard the little boy say, why doesn't my mommy kiss me anymore? And it broke her heart. And she pushed through the doors. And she grabbed her son, and she began to love him and kiss him. His black diphtheria was transferred to his mother, and within a few days, she died. Why did God save you? Because he loved you. How did God save you? With the kiss of grace upon your life and upon my life. And our sins were transferred to Christ, and he died for us at Calvary. Hallelujah. How can we ever ever take that story for granted how can we ever say the name of jesus or the name of god in vain how can we ever hastily approach easter without preparing our hearts to worship and how can we fail to give god our very best when he gave us his very best in christ it's such a hard thing to look at our mistakes our failures our willful disobedience and say, how can God not look on that and condemn me? And the reason he doesn't is because he looks and he sees his son, just like a mother hears her child's cry. Amen. And he says, you're mine. Yeah. Yeah. You're mine. Would you lead us in prayer? Father, thank you so much for the gift of forgiveness. Hallelujah. And Father, as great as that gift is, thank you for the gift that there is now no more condemnation. Lord, if we feel condemnation, it's not coming from you. We're either bringing it on ourselves, or we're listening to voices that are not yours. And Father, I pray tonight that you would help us to ditch baggage that's holding us back from everything that you have called us to be. Lord, we accept your forgiveness Mm. and we accept, Lord, now the freedom and the liberty and the redemption that comes because of that forgiveness. Restore us, O Lord, create in us a clean heart. And then, Father, throw open the doors when it's your time for us to come out of the ark and start in a refreshed new world, Lord, a brand new life as you've created Father, I thank you for the truth that we are saved and justified in Christ. And I pray that you will keep your people strong in faith, full of hope and abounding in love as we live each and every day knowing you have sealed us inside and out with the blood of your Son, 
we rejoice in the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for helping me tonight. And I notice you've got your green on I've for St. Patrick's green on. Day. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's a great, uh, did you do it in your blog or on video today? It's on video. It's on Facebook. About St. Patrick's Day. You should go and watch. Did you watch it? No, I got to listen to a little oh, bit of it, but not all of it. Okay. Good night. God bless you.